My name is Nikki. I'm the dietitian at Vital Choice Health Store. I'm so excited to be talking to you this evening and um, we'll get rolling here. So quick disclaimer, this is intended for educational purposes only. Um, because I am not your personal healthcare practitioner, I don't know what medications you're on or what your health history looks like. So it's really important. We're going to talk about a lot of things tonight, um, but it's important to make sure that you consult your personal healthcare practitioner or doctor before making any changes to lifestyle, diet, medication, supplements, those kinds of things. Let's start with just the very basics of digestion. So, um, I used to say digestion starts in the mouth, but it actually starts in the brain. Before we even put food in our mouths, um, just the, the sight of food and, and using our, so the smell, our, our brain talks to the rest of our system to start releasing like salivary juices and get the enzymes going. So before we even actually put food in our, in our mouth, our brain's already connecting with the gut to tell it what to do and to kind of prepare. Um, so it then trans transfers down the esophagus um, into the stomach. The liver puts out um, bile, it's stored in the gallbladder. Um, food will go then into uh, breakdown in the stomach, go into the small intestine, and then into the large intestine. So the intestines are really where everything's absorbed. It's broken down in the stomach and then absorbed and then finally eliminated. So uh, that's a long, there's a lot of things. Our intestines are very, very long if you stretch them out. Um, so there are a lot of places where things can go wrong. And that's kind of what we're going to get into today. 70% um, of Americans are burdened with a GI issue. This is something that is so common. Almost every single one of my clients has some sort of GI symptom, whether it's heartburn, or pain after they eat, bloating, that kind of distension and discomfort where you feel like overly full, um, diarrhea, constipation, you know, irregularity issues. So those are very, very common and most likely you or someone very close to you deals with those on a, a somewhat regular basis. Hippocrates, the founder of modern medicine says all disease begins in the gut and I really think he was on to something, you know, 2,500 or yeah, 2,500 years ago, I think is, is around that time. Um, one of the reasons that this we're finding more and more holds true, that statement, is the fact that our microbiome, so this collection of probiotics and good flora um, that's in and on us, you know, hundreds and, you know, billions of these tiny, tiny little microbes. Um, that communicate with our system. So they, they're very heavily dense in the stomach and intestine lining, um, but they're everywhere. They're on us and in us. Um, they communicate with the immune system and the brain. So this is gonna be a theme that you may not have realized uh, you were kind of going to be hearing about is we're not just gonna be talking about GI health. We're gonna be talking about the health of the whole system. Why? Because the gut impacts the immune system. It impacts uh, the way we feel. That's where vitamins can be synthesized and also things absorbed into the system. So if we don't have the proper nutrients, our cells may not function properly. It's also where we produce neurotransmitters and it can also, microbes can assist in reducing inflammation. So the enteric nervous system is nicknamed the second brain. This is two thin layers of more than hundred million nerve cells that line the gut. And this is really where I, I talked about neurotransmitters. Those are those chemical messengers that increase or decrease different actions in the body. Um, you're probably familiar with neurotransmitters like serotonin, which is like that feel good chemical. That's actually most of it, over 90% is made in the gut, not in the brain where we used to think it was made. Dopamine, GABA, acetylcholine. There's tons of neurotransmitters that are made actually in our gut lining. So if we don't have a proper functioning gut, we're now tapping into or affecting the immune system. We're affecting micronutrient utilization. We're affecting mood um, because if these feel good chemicals aren't being made properly, we don't feel good. We're not as happy. We don't have the proper chemicals. Cognitive function, things like brain fog, if, if our gut's not healthy can be a, a big symptom. 
So this talk is really focused on the gut, of course, but um, you can see that, and you will see when we talk about taking care of our gut, that then translates into impacting much more um, the whole body. So definitely Hippocrates, if you ask me, was, was pretty correct in his statement. So what are these things that affect the gut? What contributes to having issues with gut? Poor sleep, certainly toxins, um, medications we'll touch on a little bit, stress we will touch on, brain issues, food sensitivities, dehydration, and of course I'm going to be kind of deep diving into diet. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about um, most of these as far as how they affect functional GI issues. Now what I mean by that is there are structural GI issues and that could be where there are um, like strictures or diverticulitis or little pockets or twists in the, like there are structural things, narrowing of the esophagus. Um, that's not, those aren't things that you can change as much with lifestyle and diet, but functional GI issues, that is where we can really make a lot of difference. And for most people, that's where their issue is. They go to a GI doctor, they have a scope, they don't see anything. Everything looks normal. I hear that time and time again. And so then it becomes, okay, so what else is going on? I can't physically see anything wrong. There's nothing structurally wrong. Where else can we look? And it's, it's those things on your screen right now that we'll, we'll touch on and see. I'm going to start with um, talking about GERD and reflux, and then I'm going to get into IBS and then leaky gut. So we're going to hit on a lot of the major issues with the gut, but most of what I'm saying, especially towards the end, when I get deeper into diet and to supplements, no matter what GI issue you have, those can, can hold true as far as the changes you can make. So let's talk about GERD. GERD is a physical condition. So this is where acid from the stomach backs up, it goes backwards into the esophagus, and it can be very, very uh, damaging and cause a lot of discomfort. Why? Because acid is very strong and it is our stomach lining can handle it, but it, it really can destroy other um, areas where their mucosal lining isn't quite as uh, hardy, I guess is, is the best way to say it. So um, you may notice symptoms of heartburn. It feels like discomfort um, in the heart, hoarseness, coughing a lot, maybe trouble swallowing or food kind of feeling like it's stuck a bitter or sour taste that kind of acid hits in the back of the throat. But not, some people have what's called silent reflux and they don't necessarily notice the obvious symptoms even though that acid is still backing up. So um, the risk of GERD increases with age. Um, it is definitely something that I see as people get older, they tend to have more of an issue with it. And then other things like pregnancy and um, you know having some sort of trauma, those can, that also, you know, impact GERD and, and those types of symptoms. 60 million people experience heartburn at least once a month and 25 million experience symptoms daily. Most people, and when I say most, 95% of people are usually able to connect those symptoms to a dietary choice, to some sort of food that they're eating. And to my dismay, unfortunately, even though 95% of people recognize it's food related, still are put on medications. So GERD medications are widely prescribed um, or people are just taking over-the-counter options. And it's really like bothersome to me when it's like you can make a food change instead of going on a medication. And that's also because those medications that you take for GERD, that you take for heartburn, aren't really good for overall health, especially long-term. Um, Nexium is the most popular, I would say, uh, acid-stopping medication. It's the highest selling drug behind Lipitor. So it's Lipitor is a cholesterol medication. So it's these, these types of medications are used very prevalently. But they have a lot of risks, and they have risks that are not usually talked about. I want to talk about them today. Um, so PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, these are medications that actually physically block um, the production of acid in the stomach. The problem with that is 
We need acid for our foods to break down. We need acid to keep pathogens um, in check. We need acid to absorb certain micronutrients, specifically calcium, iron, B12, magnesium. So if you are taking a medication that is blocking those things from happening, what do you think is going to happen long-term? Um, they're not meant for long-term use. Um, there are connections between long-term proton pump inhibitor use and dementia. Um, check out the label. If you're someone that takes a Nexium, a Prilosec, or a medication, read the, the little leaflet or um, the over-the-counter ones will say right on there, do not take longer than 14 days. And that is because of all of the associated risk, increased risk of kidney disease. Like there's a lot of problems with taking these things long-term. Um, there was a study published uh, that found older individuals who regularly took PPIs were twice as likely to be hospitalized with kidney failure than those that weren't. And a study that was published in, I think, 2016 showed that as an association with long-term use and dementia, um, and that was a big one. They looked at over 73,000 um, subjects, 75 and older. So really like they say like a max of eight weeks, and yet people are on these just forever. And it's not necessarily that they're on them forever because the doctor wants you to be on them forever. It could be just because they're not looking to see how long you've been on it and they're not working to get you off of it. You're not doing anything else. So there are things you can do that can help you get off of these medications. Now, I will say never just stop a PPI because there will be a rebound effect and it will be very uncomfortable. So if you ever just, you know, you've been on Nexium for a year and you just stop it cold turkey, you will probably feel very uncomfortable and that's not going to be a good way to go. So you really want to work with a doctor to help wean you off. And then you definitely want to explore this whole concept of too much versus not enough acid. Whenever someone has acid reflux or GERD or heartburn, they automatically assume it's because I have too much acid. But actually acid production declines with age. So when I've said the prevalence for GERD is, is higher in those that are older, but yet acid is down in those with, that are older, it's, it's kind of an interesting way to look at it that it, it doesn't seem to add up, that all of a sudden you're producing more acid at, at 60 or 70 years old. Um, when stomach acid is measured in people that have these types of symptoms, it's almost always low, not high. And so the reason you're getting symptoms of acid reflux is because there's not enough acid, not enough acid causes a relaxed, um, that muscle, that sphincter, um, in the esophagus and it impairs the breakdown of food. So if you don't have enough acid, the food kind of sits there, that little, like I think of it like a garage door, that sphincter kind of swings open a little bit. And so it, it allows everything to come back up because you're still producing a little bit of acid. So you're, you're probably not feeling comfortable because you're not digesting well because you don't have enough acid. So it's just a complete opposite way to look at it and test for, you don't want to test for it if you're taking a medication to lower acid because you can't then add acid in at the same time. But it is something to think about maybe weaning off of those PPIs slowly with under the doctor's care and then thinking about adding in some, some acid. Um, I, I see it all the time when people do like an apple cider vinegar test um, or they'll take a betaine hydrochloric acid pill and they actually feel better. And then they start to correct their indigestion because they're digesting well. And that's, that's the whole idea between the, the not enough acid um, theory. Not everyone, some people do produce too much, but it is far less common in people, especially older people that they're just not producing enough so their digestion is suffering. So what can you do? Check for food triggers. We're gonna get deeper into diet and foods a little later, um, but that's certainly something that, that should be looked at. Dairy, caffeine, alcohol, fried foods, like really heavy fatty foods, refined carbohydrates. Um, those are the big culprits that I find people tend to be sensitive to. 
sometimes tomato products and spicy foods as well. So I'll usually try to eliminate as many as I can, um, whoever's willing, and then we see how that goes. Um, I will tell you time and time again, though, when people change their diet, their symptoms are drastically better, um, like to the point where they barely need to be on a medication, if at all, or they're completely off of it. So please don't rule out diet changes. I know it's a little more work. I know it's like, oh, I don't want to give up coffee and alcohol. But if the answer is getting off of a medication that could be potentially harmful for you, I think it's worth it. Um, there are supplements. Again, we'll get into those in deeper. I'll give you some specific brands of, of supplements in a little bit. Um, but digestive enzymes will help to break down the food. And then you want to add something that's soothing and healing. DGL is a type of licorice that you chew um, and it won't increase blood pressure. And it will um, kind of coat and heal so that if there is acid coming back up, it kind of protects that lining and is really soothing and you can chew a few a day and there's no negative, you know, it's not gonna cause malabsorption of nutrients or anything like that. Slippery elm, you can get those in lozenges and then aloe, those are all really healing and soothing for someone that has GERD. Um, and then we talked a little bit about considering adding in an acid, as long as you're not on a medication that's doing the opposite and then making sure you're checking with the doctor. So. Those are kind of the big points for GERD. We'll get, like I said, deeper into some of those diet specifics um, and su specific supplements in a little bit. I want to talk about, switch gears a little bit and talk about IBS because IBS is such a popular um, issue. It is basically just changes in how the GI tract works. It's usually associated with some sort of irregularity. It used to be a um, diagnosis of ex like when other things are ruled out. So they rule out all these other things and then it's like, okay, we'll just call it IBS. But in the, in the last you know, 15, 20 years, we have this criteria that IBS is diagnosed if your symptoms started, you've had symptoms for like six months at least. If you have pain or discomfort at least three days each month, and then if you have either um, pain or discomfort improves after a bowel movement, or if you're having changes in how your stools look, maybe you're running to the bathroom more, maybe you're more constipated, those are all used to diagnose it. Um, and that's really, those are the most common symptoms is it can happen with constipation or it can be causing you to have looser stools, running to the bathroom um, and pain. I would say those are the big ones that I hear when someone has IBS. Another very popular issue, up to 60 million Americans have IBS at some point in their life. Sometimes it comes and goes. Um, it tends to affect women more than men. Um, this is not something that gets more prevalent as someone gets older. In fact, it, it affects younger people. 12% um, of all primary care visits are IBS related and about 30% of all GI visits are IBS related. Um, there's a significant healthcare and economic burden associated with IBS and um, missed work days, tons of, of doctor visits because it's a really tough thing to find something physically wrong. It's usually something that's like an outside thing coming in, whether it's stress or it's a food or a food sensitivity. Um, those are what I find uh, typically contribute the most to IBS symptoms. Stress and IBS are often talked about. The intestines are connected to the brain. I don't know if um, you attended some of my other seminars where I talk about this gut-brain connection, but there are signals, they're bi-directional, they go back and forth between the bowels and the brain. Um, this can affect bowel function and symptoms. But I always ask, like, what came first? Is it someone's stressed and then they get IBS or do they have IBS and then that makes someone stressed. So it really gets into like this vicious cycle of like a chicken and an egg kind of a thing. And it's important to be aware of it. Um, the nerves become more active during stress. So that can cause the intestines to be more sensitive, um, can contract more. IBS is even associated in patients suffering psychological problems, so anxiety, depression, so sometimes if you go in for IBS, a doctor will prescribe an antidepressant um, 
you know, it's at the start of vacation, they're looking for support for, you know, depression and stress. I would really encourage you if that is um, something that's been presented to you to try doing other stress modification um, or stress uh, management techniques, deep breathing, um, gratitude journaling. And then there's something that I want to introduce to you that you probably never heard of before, um, dynamic neural retraining system. This is something that is a, um, you can either purchase it as an online course, or you could watch it, um, you can get the DVDs. And um, it's a step-by-step -step method that really focuses on the response that's associated um, from stress, that, that, that really the toll that stress takes on the body. Um, it focuses on identifying and interrupting brain patterns that are associated with the limbic system um, or limbic system impairment that connection between the gut and the brain and what could go wrong there. So this was something that it took me a little while to really understand, like I could not understand what this was um, and how this related to the gut because I'm like, this is a course, it's like a 14 hour course, of course you don't have to do it all at once, but it takes you through different techniques that focus a lot on things like mindfulness and, um, different techniques that you can use to help this whole fight or flight, like stuck pattern that the brain gets in. When we have stress, when we've had trauma and we don't appropriately deal with it and things just build up, that brain gets stuck in fight or flight and that significantly impacts the gut. Um, so it's important to to address those things. And uh, that this is a course that does it. I am not affiliated with this course at all. It is something that I have used in my practice and really have seen some incredible things with it. Um, I had a client that had significant IBS problems. We did food sensitivity testing, got on a, you know, eliminated all of the, the foods that he was sensitive to, and he was feeling significantly better. The problem was he was never really able to get back to a normal diet. He was kind of stuck with only about 25 foods that he could eat. And 25 foods sounds like a lot, but really it's like, it's barely anything, especially because we're including fats like olive oil and spices and things that were included in that. So he was kind of living off of a few foods that we had tested to be safe for him. And it just wasn't realistic for him to to keep living like that. And it was also at risk for having more deficiencies because we couldn't vary the diet appropriately. Um, so we talked about this dynamic neural retraining system. He decided to try it. He was very faithful with doing it. And now the next time I spoke with him after doing all of this, he is able to continue to expand his food list and not have these reactions to foods anymore that he was once having. So um, that's one of my favorite stories and just something that, you know, I talk about some of these things, but when I see it in real life, it really solid solidifies it even more and, um, makes me feel like this is an, a system that is there for certain people that might make a bigger difference than some of the other changes. And maybe you've been making a ton of changes already. Um, this is, this might be worth looking into. I have the website on here, retrainingthebrain.com. There are other courses and things like this, but this is one that I, I use at my practice and it's, um, it's been really successful. So check it out. I know it's not addressing the stomach directly, but there is such a strong connection and everything in the body is related. Um, this is something for those people that are really sensitive to foods that may be dealing with a lot of anxiety or depression, fibromyalgia, chemical sensitivities, IBS, of course, um, mold issues. It's definitely worth checking out. So um, I will stop talking about that, but stress is very, very much uh, connected to, to GI issues. What about diet? So what are things that we can do in the diet? There are so many things that we can do and they tend to be somewhat individual. However, these are five pretty general recommendations that seem to help most of my clients. 
chewing your food and eating slowly. Um, this is a concept that's really been lost on people. Um, I think more and more these days, everything's on the go. I'm guilty of this myself. I'm, I'm always like running out the door, my, driving my kids somewhere, like go, go, go. Um, barely have time to sit. So I'm, I try to make myself sit, chew well, take, you know, 20 minutes or whatever to just be mindful and enjoy the meal. Um, that makes a huge, huge difference. Eating in your car, rushing around, standing, throwing stuff in your mouth, going through a drive through those are not the ways that we're gonna help GI issues. Um, stimulants can be really stimulating for the bowels as well. So if you're someone that deals with more running to the bathroom, diarrhea, those kinds of things, um, coffee, caffeine, tea, those, those types of stimulants can be really, um, promoting or provoking your symptoms. As with anything, no matter what I'm talking to someone about, eating as whole and real as possible. That means one ingredient foods, nuts, seeds, you know, wild fish, grass-fed beef, eggs, um, vegetables, fruits, like real one ingredient food, not frozen foods and stofers and lean cuisines and restaurant meals and drive-throughs and eating out of a box and cereals and all these, you know, that's what our whole world is. I go to the grocery store and there's just one aisle of just potato chip flavors. And then you move over and it's just cookies. And then you move over and it's crackers. And it's like, oh my gosh, we have so many processed refined foods that's not what our body is meant to have. And that's not what our guts can handle because we're not feeding it properly and it's causing a lot of inflammation. So one ingredient foods as much as possible. If you need guidance on that, um, I'll give you some diets that, that are out there very popular that you can um, use as resources. Uh, monitor your fiber intake. Fiber can be great or not so great. It is totally independent on the person. It is very individual. Fiber can help make you more regular or sometimes it can aggravate, especially insoluble fiber. So take a look at your diet, <clears throat> excuse me, and see, um, are you eating a lot of roughage, a lot of good vegetables, a lot of nuts and seeds and whole grains and things? If you are, maybe you need to back off on that. Or if you're not, maybe some fiber in. If you add it in, take it very slowly, like tiny amounts and then slowly increase. And as you increase fiber, you want your water to come up as well. Um, so that's very important. Fiber does play a key role. Most people want around 25 to 35 grams, but there are people that can't tolerate that much. We also want to avoid foods that you are intolerant to or reactive to. Sounds really easy, right? If you're reacting to a food, we'll just eliminate it. Um, some of the big culprits are dairy, wheat, caffeine, coffee, cruciferous vegetables. So those are like your broccoli and Brussels sprouts um, and cauliflower. Garlic and onion can also be problematic. Um, the problem is sometimes it's really hard to tell if you're sensitive to a certain food. It's, it's not like, and I, I wish this was the case where it's like, I eat a food and there's a really major reaction every time I have it. You know, if I had corn and then I had corn chips, I'd have a major reaction immediately and I would know it. Those are like your anaphylactic reactions that people have that are life threatening. We don't want those kinds of reactions, but it would be nice to see. It would be easier to identify if people had a more immediate reaction to foods. These kinds of sensitivities that I'm talking about can take a couple days to really manifest. So if you're having a headache or if you're having a, a bout of IBS, it could have been because of something you ate the day before or two days before. And it makes it very difficult then to figure out, okay, what is really causing my symptoms? And there's a difference between intolerances and sensitivities. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little later, but let's get, let's get deeper into the good foods first. So foods that heal the gut, vegetables and fruits. Um, of course, you knew you weren't gonna come to one of my talks without me promoting vegetables that everyone knows are good for us. And yet 
only one in 10 Americans are eating enough. So we've got to bump it up. We've got to do better. Um, raw vegetables for some people with digestive issues can be harder on their system. So then you could do a roasted veggie um, and you could roast pretty much everything. A um, little olive oil or avocado oil, throw it in the oven, make sure everything's kind of cut a similar size. Sometimes I flip it once and it's, you know, 350 for depending on the size of 20 minutes. Foods taste, vegetables taste so much better roasted than like a frozen vegetable that you're boiling. It's just not the same. So if you can't tolerate raw, try roasting. Um, you could add whatever spices and, and seasoning that you like. Um, in fact, I encourage it because herbs and spices are very healing as well. We tend to just think of them for flavor, but they're very anti-inflammatory, contain a lot of antioxidants and are really helpful for um our health really all around um, for many different conditions. We want healthy fats, especially omega-3 fatty acids, which are really important in lubricating and, and helping to keep the, the inflammation down in the gut. Um, so olive oil, avocado, wild salmon, wild sardines, um, almonds, walnuts, those are some of your best fats that, that you can add in. We also want to take a look at prebiotic foods. And I see especially like at the store, I would say probably two or three years ago, all of a sudden like prebiotics was the, the buzzword. It used to be probiotics and now like prebiotic is, is everywhere. So probiotics are the good flora. That's your, your beneficial bacteria or yeast. Prebiotics are the food for those bacteria. So we want to feed them to encourage them to colonize and, and you know, thrive. Prebiotics are any food that has a uh, good fiber in it. So if there's fiber, that's a prebiotic. So psyllium is a prebiotic. Apples are prebiotic. Jerusalem artichokes, jicama, dark leafy greens, um, garlic, onion, cabbage. Those are all great prebiotic sources. So do you need a supplement prebiotic? Well, if you're eating you know, these kinds of foods regularly, then those should act as the prebiotic and you shouldn't need a supplement. But for those that don't or that just need extra um, support, you can certainly take a prebiotic powder. Um, the fermented foods, so kombucha, sauerkraut, real sauerkraut, not the sauerkraut that's it on the shelf, the sauerkraut that's in the like cooler section or refrigerated section, that's where you find a lot of, uh, you know, Cleveland kraut, or um, there's other brands that make fermented sauerkraut or fermented kimchi or fermented beets or whatever it is that they're uh, fermenting. There's a lot of, a lot more products now. Heinen's has a great selection. Um, even Giant Eagle has some good ones, but that's different than them just putting salt water and putting it on the shelf. Like those pickles that are on the shelf aren't really fermented. So we want a fermented cucumber, that's a pickle, that's in the cooler section. It's, it's a completely different food that will have all of those good probiotics there. So the idea is we're eating fermented foods and then we're feeding those fermented foods, those probiotic foods with prebiotic foods with our veggies and, and some of those other fiber foods. So. That's a wonderful gut healing diet. Of course, the worst foods that are gonna harm the gut are going to be your refined sugars and processed foods. And just a spoiler alert, I don't know that I will ever have a talk where I will say, hey, guess what guys, we found a benefit to refined sugars and processed foods. It's not gonna happen. I, I've been doing this a long time and every single condition is really uh, hurt by refined sugars and processed foods from cancers to Alzheimer's disease, to diabetes, to heart disease, the number one killer, um, of course, to gut issues. So we've got to do better at removing these foods. Um, they change our microbiome. They actually feed more of the bad pathogens and, and our good pathogen, our good um, microbes suffer. They damage the gut lining. They promote inflammation, promote high blood sugar, oxidative stress, which is like rust. You think of rust on a car, it's like rust on our cells. Cells can't function properly when they're rusty. 
So we've got to minimize these foods as much as possible. How many grams of sugar can you eat? Should you eat in a day? How many is healthy to eat? Um, I always say zero because we don't need any. So any amount you have is more than what our body requires. However, um, I've seen, you know, American Heart Association and um, the Academy of Dietetics, they've put out, you know, 24 grams or lower, you know, maybe four to six teaspoons, but we just get so much because it's in our bread, it's in our pasta sauces, it's in our cereals, it's in, um, we add it to coffees and, and our, these drinks, these sweetened beverages, I can, I can do a whole, you know, two hours just on the beverages. Um, but it's just important to be aware of. You could write down what you eat for a couple of days and see like, oh my gosh, that had sugar in it. That was processed. That has sugar in it. Oh my gosh, look, I'm, I'm getting so much more than I realized. Um, such, sometimes I just start with removing sugary beverages for people. And that's, that's the big change that you make. Do a lot for your GI uh, health and the health of your whole body. Let's talk about some of these trigger foods. Um, I mentioned them before. Obviously, if a structural issue is not found and doctors not seeing anything physically wrong, it's probably something you're putting in your body. It could be a toxin, it could be something else, it could be stress, but typically, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think I'm overstating when I say if someone has a GI issue, there will be a food that's making it worse. Just fact. Um, figuring out that food is the difficulty. Um, so the difference is between a sensitivity and an intolerance. You've probably heard of like lactose intolerance. That is, does not involve the immune system. That is simply you don't have an enzyme to break down the food. So this happens with gluten. It happens with fructose, lactose, which is the sugar in dairy. Um, you don't have an enzyme to break those down. Intolerances typically are a little more obvious and they um, tend to be quicker acting. So for instance, if you wanna test out if you have a lactose intolerance, when you wake up before you've had any other food, drink a glass of milk and then wait a couple hours. And you will probably, if you do have a lactose intolerance, have a significant reaction to that. Um, Cheese isn't always a good test because not all cheese is high in lactose. So I, I tend to tell people like, if you really wanna see, you could of course get a test through your doctor, but that's something that's typically pretty obvious. If you have um, a glass of milk and you have a reaction you know, within a few hours, it's probably an intolerance. There are also sensitivities. Sensitivities do involve the immune system. And these are the, that category that I was talking about that can take two days to have a symptom. Um, sensitivities promote leaky gut. We're gonna talk about leaky gut in a minute. Um, it can be anything. Gluten, eggs, dairy, and soy are big, wheat, those are big culprits, but I have done food sensitivity testing. I started to do it 15 years ago on myself because I was having unexplained issues that I knew was a food. I couldn't figure out what food. And it was things like lentils, um, lecithin, which is a, a compound naturally occurring in egg yolks and other fats. It was things that I never would have been able to figure out on my own. Um, and I was still feeling symptoms after eliminating some of these big guys. So I love food sensitivity testing. There are a lot of different labs out there. I, um, I think the first thing to start with is doing a good old fashioned elimination diet, if you're willing. That's where you do an elimination of these big culprits. So no eggs, no dairy, no gluten, no wheat, no lactose. Um, if you're wondering what the heck do I eat? I use the Institute for Functional Medicine. They have an elimination diet that you can find online and print out and it gives shopping lists and recipes and meal plans. And I use this, I use it with my clients. It's a great place to start. If you're having IBS or other GI symptoms and you want to help yourself, it's the gold standard. Um, and really for most people, it's very rare that I have someone do it. You gotta do it for like a month though, pretty strict. And then, you know, start to introduce things one at a time. Um, but if you do it, you should see significant, um, differences in, in how you're feeling. 
So the IFM elimination diet is one resource. Um, some people like to do Whole30. I don't know if you've heard of Whole30 before. Whole30 is a 30-day diet that removes processed foods and sugars and a lot of these major culprits. The Whole30, though, does not remove eggs um, or shellfish. So it's one of those that for some people, if, if eggs are suspected, you might want to do uh, a little bit of a modification there. But elimination diets are great. They don't always eliminate, like for me, didn't eliminate my specific trigger. So I use a test, a blood test called MRT, mediator release testing, tests 170 foods and chemicals. Um, the most common symptoms that people come to me with that make me go, hey, you should have this test are chronic headaches or migraines, IBS symptoms, especially IBS with diarrhea, um, not as much with constipation. I find that to be it not as necessary. So if that's your main symptom, you may not need this kind of a test, but autoimmune inflammatory issues, asthma, which was my main symptom, um, allergy, skin issues, all of those are kind of like screaming at me, okay, this is probably a sensitivity um, some sort of gut imbalance and reaction that you're having to a food. Um, I do not suggest traditional IgG blood testing, which is most likely what a doctor will order. It misses a lot. Um, it gives false positives. I often, I started by doing that and I was seeing so many clients with the same results coming back. It just didn't seem to be catching everything. This is a test I have used for years and years. And the only time someone did not feel better is because they did not eliminate the foods that came up as reactive for them. So, um, so it's, it's a wonderful thing. Again, it's called mediator release testing. And that's something that can help with this kind of leaky gut issue, which is a lot of inflammation where there are tight, should be tight junctions in the intestinal wall there's spaces and there's, there's little amounts of space where bad things can leak in, toxins, proteins that aren't supposed to be there, microorganisms, and that further fuels an inflammatory response and is, is pretty, uh, pretty damaging. So we wanna avoid things like leaky gut. We wanna avoid symptoms of IBS by changing the diet and then investigating some food triggers. Feel free to, to chat or use the Q&A for any questions if anyone has, has any up until there. I'm gonna get into some supplements now, but if you think of anything, feel free to just write it in the chat box. All right, so what can we do? We talked about diet changes. We talked a little bit about stress. What about supplements? So if you are having gas, bloating, reflux, you probably need some assistance in breaking down your food. And that's what enzymes do. So we have enzymes that our pancreas produces to help break down the food. For many of us, we don't have enough. If you have trouble with certain, if you have intolerances, you lack specific enzymes. Um, if you have IBS issues and you're getting a lot of pain and gas, enzymes may be helpful. There's a lot of enzymes out there. These are a few that I have personally used and used with clients. Digest Gold, is um, one of our strongest, most comprehensive formulas. So if you're not sure if there's a specific food that's doing it, um, Digest Gold is a great one to start with. I always travel with it because I am, you know, I've got kids now that are in competitive sports and sometimes we can't help but eat out. And um, I, I could not do that before I was taking enzymes. So it's really saved me if I'm at a wedding or something and I don't have as many choices that, that I won't react to an enzyme is, is my saving grace. So um, Digest Spectrum is by the same company and Enzymetica specializes in enzymes. That's all they make. They are amazing at it. And um, it really covers you from start to finish of digestion. So that's why I, I just love that brand. Um, Digest Spectrum is specific for those with intolerances. So if you know you have a gluten issue, if you know you have a dairy issue, it doesn't allow you to just eat those foods free will because you, it, you know, no pill can take away if you have a, a true issue with a food, but they're like a safety net. So if you are stuck in eating out or if you do want to splurge and, and have ice cream one day, you can take an enzyme to help you so you're not doubled over in pain or running to the bathroom all night. Um, 
Vital Choice Superzymes. This is one of my favorite products. I have not seen it anywhere else other than Vital Choice. And it is just this perfect combination of enzymes and acid. So it's got betaine hydrochloric acid, which mimics our stomach acid and bile acids, which really gives even more support for digestion. Um, I am someone that found out I actually have lower stomach acid and by increasing my acid, it's, it's really helped a lot of my symptoms. This is a product I will put people with reflux or GERD on as long as they're not on a medication lowering acid because your stomach should be acidic. And it's unbelievable the benefit they feel when they add this enzyme and acid and better the digestion um, versus just suppressing it. So that's a great product. Um, again, it's called Superzymes and it's, it's really worth checking out. So that's gas bloating, reflux, kind of indigestion, intolerances. Those are the, the supplements you'll want for those kinds of symptoms. What about regularity issues, either constipation or you're running to the bathroom, immune support, gut healing, probiotics. Those are those good bacteria, those good microbes. It could be good yeast as well. Um, they boost our natural flora. They help with nutrient absorption. They're not breaking down the food, that's enzymes, but they're helping with absorption and do an amazing job with um, regularity. Whether someone is constipated or having diarrhea, I find probiotic can be helpful for both. There's one particular formula called colon care that I tend to go to first because it really is um, formulated for those with like IBS type issues. It's a high bifido formula. Bifido is the particular strain of probiotics. So it's instead of lactobacillus, it's higher in these bifido strains that do support um, di uh, regularity. So that's a great product. It's a one a day. It's a 50 billion. Um, that's how probiotics are measured. They're not measured by milligrams or measured by billions, which I know sound like a lot, but remember we have hundreds of billions and trillions in and on us. So it's really not that much. For gut healing, I like to introduce a probiotic that has uh, soil-based organisms, which really help with healing. Um, Bacillus subtilis and Saccharomyces boulardii are two um, probiotics in primal defense. Primal defense is a different type of probiotic. When I first looked at it, I went like, it's only 5 billion in one pill. I said, this is nothing. And um, noticed a pretty significant reaction the first time I tried it in a good way. I didn't realize that it was the types of strains that were more important in a way than how much, how strong it is. So you don't need hundreds of billions if you've got these specific strains that are more resilient and really help to normalize intestinal function and regularity. Um, so that's primal defense. Those are just two of the entire section of probiotics. So if you're questioning which one to go on, come on into the store or call us um, and one of the staff can take you through the, the tons of options that are there because everyone's a little different. And to speak to that as well, if you've ever tried a probiotic and you, it didn't do anything for you, it's probably because it wasn't the right probiotic for you. Um, I don't think everyone needs to be on a probiotic, but there are definite instances where they can make a huge difference. And those with GI issues is one of those times. Okay, what about constipation? Magnesium, we tend to be so deficient in magnesium anyways. And for someone with a constipation prominent IBS, magnesium can really be helpful. Um, it helps to relax the smooth muscle, so of the colon, and it helps to draw water in, allowing a normal bowel movement. Um, a magnesium deficiency not only causes constipation, but can also lead to other issues. So if you're having trouble sleeping, if you're getting leg cramps, if you get headaches, um, muscle pain, uh, those are some of the other, you know, uh, reasons that mag you might be lacking magnesium. Those are kind of some signals saying you should probably be on a magnesium. Magnesium is very calming. It's calming uh, physically. So if you have tightness or tension or cramping or stomach issues, it can help relax. But also uh, mentally, if you're anxious, you're having trouble sleeping, 
Uh, this product, Natural Calm, is a drink. There's tons of different pill forms of magnesium, but this is a very popular product that works pretty quickly. So I'll have people take it in the evening, helps them sleep, helps their leg cramps. And then in the morning, they have a bowel movement. So it's, it's a nice product. Um, on the other side, too much magnesium can cause loose stools. So if someone is more, pro more uh, prone to having diarrhea or running to the bathroom, you may want to go slow with magnesium and, or take a specific form called magnesium glycinate, which won't impact the bowels. So magnesium is wonderful. Um, we tend to lack a lot of it and, and it can be really good support there. I wanted to touch on gut healing as well. And there's a kind of a superstar amino acid called glutamine that is, um, we have high amounts of in our gut lining. It's anti-inflammatory. Um, it repairs the gut, it heals. If you have leaky gut or if you have a lot of sensitivities or damage, glutamine is something that can be really helpful. Um, there's a product on the screen called Glutashield, which I have taken. I've done um, these kind of courses or these uh, regimens of gut healing supplements, and I'll do Glutashield and Primal Defense and a digestive enzyme typically, and I try to eliminate trigger foods. And that's like a amazing way. I try to eliminate sugars and all of that to really, within a month or so, one to two months typically, really calm everything down and really start the healing process. It also tastes really good. I've tried a lot of powdered like GI supplements and most of them are not delicious. This one I actually enjoy taking. It comes in vanilla or chocolate, which right away is more enjoyable than some of these like fruit flavored things, but, um, but it's got high amounts of glutamine. So that amino acid that helps heal. It's got DGL. So remember when I was talking about GERD, I talked about this specific form of licorice that is specifically processed to contain those active flavonoids um, supporting that mucosal lining and healing. So this is also great for someone with GERD. Uh, it has aloe for inflammation and irritation. It has zinc carnosine, which is a specific form of zinc that strengthens the GI barrier function, helps to keep those junctions tight. This is not a supplement you take every day forever. This is a supplement that you do twice a day for two months and along with maybe making some diet changes and, and then you're off of it. You don't need to take this forever, um, but it can really do a lot if someone really wants to, to work on their gut health um, in a more functional medicine way, um, that, that's a great way to do it. That's kind of one of my favorite protocols, elimination diet or Whole30, Glutashield, probiotic, um, digestive enzyme, those are great ways to go. So the big takeaways are gonna be Help your stress tolerance. This could be, this is something that's so overlooked. And I feel like sometimes I'm a broken record because I say it so much, but it's so important to just take moments to breathe, to practice mindfulness, to um, meditate or do deep breathing exercises. Or like, There's so many resources out there. Um, take time for you. And that can then manifest and help with gut. You can even check out the dynamic neural retraining system and, and, and see, check out the website, see if it, it, you know, speaks to you. Cleaning up the diet, of course, unprocessed diet, rich in plant foods. I've never had anyone with a gut issue, not, you know, make diet changes and say, I feel the same way. It just doesn't happen. What you're putting in your body, what's going directly to the stomach is affecting you. Um, consider supplements like we talked about, Consider an elimination diet or food sensitivity testing. If you don't want to eliminate all these things that you feel like you don't need to, get a blood test and look, but not every blood test is the same. So consider something like MRT mediator release test, um, which to me is, is one of the best. There's another lab called Cyrex that makes a good one as well. Um, I haven't used that um, specifically, but I've had other um, fellow dietitians and functional medicine practitioners speak highly of that one. So those would be the two that if you're going to do a blood test, think about one of those two. So that's it. I, I have some time. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, we did record this. So this will be up on our website. 
You also, um, for those of you that have registered and are attending this live, you will receive an email with a special savings code tomorrow. Um, and I believe a link to uh, a PDF of the presentation. So thank you all for joining me. Does anyone have any questions? Guys are quiet. This is the hard thing about doing these over online instead of in person. All right, well, I will let you all go. Thank you so much for joining me and um, feel free. Oh, I see a question pop up. Um, if you are currently on a medication for acid reflux, is it safe to remove on your own? No. Um, I mean, you can, but you can't go cold turkey with an acid reflux medication, especially if you've been on it for a long time. You've been suppressing that acid for so long. If you stop it, it's like pulling all the corks out. And all of a sudden, you're going to have all this acid. So typically what we do in my practice, we taper it down, but you definitely would want to get in touch with whatever doctor prescribed it and see if you can talk about weaning off of it. And they'll usually give you a protocol like this is how we, we do half a pill and then we go down to every other day or whatever their protocol is, um, they'll be able to monitor that. Reflux is dangerous because it, there's, the doctors are worried about it because it damages the esophageal lining and it can make you more prone to having some serious issues. So I understand their want to suppress it. It's just probably for most people, they would have been better off changing the diet and actually bettering digestion with some supplements. Um, so yeah, so be careful with that. Definitely get in touch with your health practitioner and um, work with them for that. Okay, thanks everyone. Enjoy your evening, eat some vegetables and stay hydrated. <laughs> Bye.